Welcome to The Dividing Line. My name is James White. Let's try this all again, shall we? <laughs> uh, two hours ago, we tried this, and uh, the audio did not work for us. Do not know why. Uh, it'd be good if we knew why, but uh, do not know why. Uh, but we're doing it completely differently now, so we will see if this is going to work. I am running blind in here, uh, so I don't know what's going on, but uh, uh, we'll... Um, there, oh, hey, there it is. Uh, it's that icky looking uh, pixelated one, but it's at least uh, it, it's, it's at least there. So uh, what we were doing before we most rudely interrupted by technical difficulties and uh, could be rudely interrupted again. Uh, we, we have no way of, uh, the tests worked fine, but one thing I, I learned running sound at a very large church once is you can test everything you want and it can work absolutely perfectly uh, before before the the show starts, and then once the show starts, well, it's it's completely different. Um, someone in channel says it's the the uh, uh, the Tribble's fault, uh, which which is the wild card issue. Uh, we had not uh, we had not actually had the Tribble make the Tribble sound on the program before, so it it is a possible possible issue. I I sort of doubt it though. Anyway, uh, I was mentioning that um, last week or the week before last, we had encountered a summer reading list that included uh, Don Johnson's book and The Petals Fall, a rebuttal of tulip theology. So here uh, you can see uh, there's and the petals fall, a rebuttal of tulip theology. And... Um, I wanted to find out specifically uh, of all the things that the advertisement on the website indicated was uh, how John 6 actually teaches the opposite of Calvinism. And we've been looking at some attempts to uh, get around the teaching of John chapter 6. And what we're discovering is there's really only one way to do it. And uh, that is uh, basically to... Uh, Ins insist, and notice he has to get on his old man glasses here, is to insist that those that the Father gives to the Son, the Father gives because of a pre-existing fulfillment of certain requirements on the part of that individual. Pre-existing faith, the goodness of that individual, uh, person was already a believer, etc., etc., etc. And so this is this is actually taking the faithful Jews before Jesus and making them into faithful believers, in essence, is all that allegedly this is saying. Now, the problem with that, of course, um, is that, that that doesn't answer the question of the text itself, because the specific Jews to whom Jesus is speaking, are not identified as uh, Jewish leaders. These are not the, they're not identified as scribes and Pharisees. In fact, they're identified as what? Mathetai, disciples. And then it said that they were no longer following <clears throat> after Jesus. They went away. But this group that is unbelieving is specifically different than the violent response of the Jews in John chapter 5 and John chapter 8 and John chapter 10. These are individuals who had listened all day to Jesus the day before, and they're now seeking after signs. They're not naturally the enemies of Jesus' claims. They are friendly toward all of that. They, they don't mind being called disciples. They, they've rode across a lake. To find Jesus. And yet Jesus says, you are unbelievers. Why are they unbelievers? Because they're not looking to Jesus as their sole source of spiritual sustenance and that they need to uh, recognize this reality. And when they see the focused proclamation of the gospel upon the person of Jesus Christ, they are offended, but they're offended on the level of saying, this is a difficult saying, who can understand it? Who can, who is able to, to, to bear it, and they turn around and they walk away. They, they don't try to stone Jesus. They don't try to throw him off of a, uh, 
you know, a, a cliff. They don't try to get the, um, the Romans to come and, and take him away or anything like that. And so the whole idea that what you've got here is Jesus explaining that those that the Father gives me are the ones the Father has already found faithful in believing in him is the exact opposite of what we would conclude when we look at the situation in John chapter 6, because that would mean that the 11 disciples, we'll leave Judas out of this for the moment, though he's an interesting aspect of the study, that the 11 disciples are given by the Father the Son because the Father already knows that they are good, that they are better than others that they are faithful, uh, that they are more pliable. That it always comes down to the same thing, no matter how you slice it. When people say, well, I want to come up with a third way. I, would, I don't, this Calvinism, Arminian, there's just not enough uh, options here. It's real simple. Either you're going to be in heaven because you were better than other people, or you're going to be in heaven because of God's grace. One of the two. That's one of the two. And you need to realize the synergist who says, oh, it's all of grace. If it weren't for God's grace, no one would be saved. Uh, that's great. That's fine. That's wonderful. Rome says the same thing. Even, even Mormonism says that. Now, obviously, it's greater and lesser extents as to the, the role of grace in all of this. But if you're a synergist, you can talk about grace till the cows come home. But A, grace itself can't save. And B, there is something other than God's free will that constrains the success of God's grace and salvation. That's just, you've got to establish that to be a synergist. Although, if you don't, you're a monergist. And so what you're hearing here is, well, sure sounds like in John 6 there are these strong words, but the reality is that the ones that the Father gives have fulfilled certain requirements. They're God-fearers, they're more spiritually sensitive, whatever, however you want to fill it in, that's, that's how it's going to work. Let's, uh, let's li listen to what uh, Don Johnson and the Petals Fall uh, says here. <clears throat> Having said the scriptures mean what they say and say what they mean, all three of the above verses, well, which is John 637, 644, and 665, uh, are true as they stand, and there is no need to change any word whatsoever in them or infer anything into them. They are to be believed exactly as they were written. There is, however, one small caveat. These verses were all applicable at that time in history when Jesus spoke them. And when I saw that time in bold, I thought, oh, is this the dispensational way around this? Because we've looked at a couple sort of hyper-dispensational. This was only had to do with the Jews and, you know, uh, that type of thing. But it's not. <laughs> when he spoke those words during his earthly ministry, all three verses were relevant for that period of time. There is no need to get around them, nor should there be. Since it is the Father who gives, or the Father who draws, or those who were given by the Father, the questions are asked, who is given by the Father? Verse 37. Who is it that the Father draws? Verse 44. Who are they that were given unto the Son by the Father? Verse 65. To answer these questions, let's begin by looking at a parallel passage, and he goes to John chapter 10. At least it is, in fact, a parallel passage. It's nice that it is relevant. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them to me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Definitely a parallel text. You have the giving of the Father to the Son, the Son's role in salvation, the very triune nature of salvation here, um, that the Father and the Son are united in the salvation of God's people. Definitely the parallel passage. Mr. Johnson goes on, Jesus said that his sheep hear his voice, they know him, they follow him, and he gives them eternal life. Then he said, my Father which gave them me. Here is the giving that was mentioned back in John 6, 37, 6, 65. If they are Jesus' sheep, and they follow him because they hear his voice, then the logical ex extension is they were his father's sheep, then they must also have followed the father and heard him. Two, two things. Notice the insertion 
of the synergism there. Synergism got inserted there. It says, if they are Jesus' sheep and they follow him because they hear his voice. No, they hear his voice because they're his sheep. See, this is, this is, it is just so incredibly common for the synergist to insert synergism into his interpretation of monergistic passages. Let me give you an example of this. It's one that I've used many times before. But uh, look with me real quickly at John chapter 8. And there are two texts that I like to point out at this point. I've done it before, but it fits with this, and so it, 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 it works together. And, and by the way, uh, since it's later in the day, we might even get some calls. 877-753-3341. 877-753-3341. Verse 43, John 8, 43. Why do you not understand what I am saying? Now, stop right there. He's talking to fake believers. These are, these are the ones who, who had, uh, earlier in the chapter, had heard him saying, arguing with the Jews, and like this, and they believed in him. Eris, not present tense. It's, it's not saving faith in the Gospel of John that is in view here. But they had believed in him. And as soon as Jesus said, if you continue my word... Then you're my disciples indeed. You shall know the truth. The truth shall set you free. As soon as Jesus says you shall be set free, they become offended. If you want to find out if someone uh, has really embraced grace and understood their, their, their true standing before God, talk about the need to be set free. And uh, it, it's not long until that old man comes popping out. What do you mean set free? I don't need to be set free. Uh, well, uh, so they, they become upset. So this is who he's talking to. And if he said, why do you not understand what I am saying? What's, what's the response going to be from a monergist versus a synergist? Now, there's going to be lots of synergistic responses to this. Jesus' response is, it is because you cannot hear my word. You are unable, u dunatai, it's here, it's u Dunasta, a kuwine. You are not able to hear. You lack the capacity, the ability to hear my word, and therefore you do not understand. So, I guess what's being suggested by many people today is that there are certain lost people that this is descriptive of but only certain ones. There are others who possess the ability to hear and that this does not apply to them. This is only these particular individuals, that there would have been others. Now remember, these are, again, faux disciples, just as in John chapter 6. Now they're going to end up picking up stones to stone Jesus in John chapter 8. But they had just believed in Jesus. These aren't the Jewish leaders in that sense, though I would say the application is the same to anyone. You're of your father, the devil. Are there people who do not have the devil as their father? Something tells me that a lot of these synergists would have to come to that conclusion that yes, yeah, only certain people have the devil as their father. So there's there's the there's a, there's a much wider variety of people uh, from their perspective, I would assume. I would assume. But then notice, notice verse 47. He who is of God hears the words of God. Now, what we're hearing from, what we hear from Mr. Johnson, already started to hear from Mr. Johnson, is that to belong to God, to be of God, is to already have demonstrated that you fear God, that you're a God-fearer. And so, this is something that people can accomplish in and of themselves. It's something that, that can be done apart from the supernatural activity of saving grace. I don't 
haven't read enough of the book yet to know if he's into prevenient grace and all the rest of that kind of stuff. But verse 47 says, Ha'on ek tutheu, the one who is of God, the one who belongs to God, is hearing the rhemata of God, the words of God. For this reason you do not hear them. Now ask a synergist what the rest of the sentence is going to be without letting him read the verse. For this reason you do not hear them, because you do not choose to do so, right? That would be a true statement, but it would be an insufficient statement. They don't choose to do so. They don't want to. They don't want to submit themselves to the law of God. That's what Romans 8 says. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, because you are not of God. So the order, the reason you do not hear, is because you are not of God. Yet now we're being told there are people who can hear, and that's why they then come to belong to God is because they choose to. See, that's how you get the synergism in. Is there's something in them, they're good enough, they're different, they make the free will choice, and therefore they belong to God. Not because God chose them, but because they chose God. And that then all we're really talking about in John 6 and John 8 is an extended revelation from the God they're already following as to who he is and the revelation that he has made in Jesus Christ. That's, that's what we're going to get. So, um, if they are Jesus' sheep and they follow him because they hear his voice, then the logical extension is, well, careful, they were his father's sheep, then they must also have followed the father and heard him. See, notice that the shift now has been, I mean, if anyone's read John chapter 10, the emphasis is upon the actions, capabilities, and powers of whom? The shepherd or the sheep? The shepherd or the sheep? In any synergistic reading, it's the sheep. That's what we got right here. Then they must also have followed the Father and heard him. Why? Because they already belong to his sheep. That's the whole point of John chapter 10, is that the shepherd chooses his sheep. The shepherd defines the flock. Here, you've got the flock defining itself for the shepherd. Did that come from John chapter 10? Where did it come from? The traditions that Don Johnson have imbi has imbibed. Now, he doesn't realize that, I, I would imagine, but there it is. Otherwise, you would have a shepherd the sheep do not know, which is ridiculous, particularly in the context. Of course, but who establishes the relationship between shepherd and sheep? This is saying the sheep do. And the Bible is saying the shepherd does. Just that simple. Here we have the first clue as to who it is that was given or who it was that was drawn. These would first be the father's sheep. A category, by the way, um, that we never find in this discussion. The, the focus is upon Jesus as the shepherd of the sheep. So we have a, a new category, which is the father's sheep, who become the son's sheep, and they're given by the father to the son. And that way we can deal with John 10 and John 17 and John 6. But we've come up with this whole other discussion that for some reason doesn't make it into the Bible about how these individuals made themselves sheep by their own goodness and their own free will choice and so on and so forth. Um, what would make them the father's sheep? The fact was, just like they did with the son, they heard and followed him. This would, of course, make the father their shepherd. In other words, those who were given or those who were drawn to the son were believers in the father already. 
So what Jesus is actually doing in John chapter 6 is he's saying, you are unbelievers. You have seen me, and yet you have not believed. Believers will follow me. That's all he's saying. That's all he's saying. All the Father gives me will come to me. Well, of course. Because they've already come to the Father. So, coming and believing, it's all of man. It's all... If, if you're good in here, you'll do it. If you're not, you won't. Has nothing to do with God. It has nothing to do with his sovereignty. No, 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 no. It's all of man. And all Jesus is saying is, even though you claim to be following me, and even though you listen to my teaching, and even though you rode across the lake, and even though I look at my own 11 disciples, and they're completely confused, and, and the whole idea that, they made themselves the, the sheep of the Father beforehand because they were better than other people is just such a complete overturning of the entire concept of the New Testament. It doesn't matter. The whole point is that the only people who will come to me are the people who've already come to the Father because it'll be, it'll be natural if you've already come to the Father for you to come to the Son. And that's all I'm going to be saying here is that, well, that's, that's what's going on here. And that explains your unbelief. No, it doesn't explain their unbelief at all. It doesn't explain their unbelief at all. But that's what we're... That's what we're being told. In other words, those who were given or those who were drawn to the Son were believers in the Father already. They were not reprobates. I'm not sure how you define what a reprobate is. But were believers already in God. This is precisely why Jesus used the term the Father. God was already their Father, therefore he could give them to his Son. But why was he their Father? Because they chose to have him as such. People have either a Heavenly Father or they are of their Father the Devil. John 8, 44. All, all of the people who were drawn or given to the Son were already believers in the Father. And I'm just reading this the way he has it. Sovereign grace had nothing to do with it. Top of page 162 for all of you who have a copy. Sovereign grace in quotation marks had nothing to do with it. So, this is, we're starting to see this over and over again. Uh, last week, we looked at um, Cheryl Schatz's commentary on John 6.37 She's put another one up uh, titled, um, Why Are People Not Coming to Jesus? And if you read through it, it's the exact same argument. It's the exact same ar argument. Um, uh, section 2. God is not their father, and they do not know him. Because they do not know the father, they will not listen to Jesus or his disciples. Now, she mixes a lot of the context. She'll mix chapter 5 with, with 6 and, and, and so on and so forth. But the problem is you have to come up with the idea that there are people <clears throat> who are not described by Romans chapter 3, are not described by Jesus in John chapter 8. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 8? If you continue my word, then you'll be my disciples indeed. You shall know the truth. The truth shall set you free. How could these people have been free to follow the Father, but now had to be set free a second time to follow the Son? How does that, how does that work? You see, either you are a slave of sin, or you are a slave of righteousness. Either you have a heart of stone or a heart of flesh. Which one is it? And so, are we to understand that the people who are good enough to be the sheep of the Father and hence will be given to the Son, when do they get their heart of flesh? When's this, uh, what we call regeneration, take place? 
Were these unregenerate followers of the Father who become regenerate when they follow the Son? Or were they regenerate followers of the Father who do not become regenerated by following the Son because they're already regenerate? I, I, I don't know. Um, God is not their Father. They do not know Him because they do not know the Father. They will not listen to Jesus or His disciples. They cannot know Jesus. They cannot know who Jesus is. They, they cannot know Jesus is, they do not... There's got to be a typo there, I'm sorry. They cannot know Jesus is, they do not know the Father. And if they know Jesus, they would have to know the Father as well. They cannot hear what Jesus said because they are not of God. They have not come to know God and have the nature of liars. Well, right there is a citation of John 8, 47, but the impact was missed. They cannot hear what Jesus said because they are not of God. Not the other way around, which is the argument that's being made here. If you just look through the interpretations that are given, uh, you end up recognizing that what's being said is they are, uh, section 7, they are not of Jesus' sheep because they never belonged to the Father. They have never been believers, and because they have never believed the Father, they could not come to Jesus because the Father did not grant unbelievers to come to Jesus. So there's the exact same argument that Don Johnson's using there. Here, Cheryl Schatz is using it in this new article. And what's all of, why, why is, what's the big attempt here? Yeah, you can't get around the fact that there are particular people that the Father gives the Son. You cannot get around that. So if we're going to defend synergism, then what we have to do is we have to create a pretext that is before the text of John 6 concept of what it means to belong to the Father. So that when the Father gives, the sphere of his freedom to give is limited by what? What's it limited by? By man's choice, not by God's choice. You can't have it being God's choice. No, no, no. It's not that God owns all mankind and gives a particular elect people to the Son who are undeserving and they're graciously saved. No, 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 no. We can't, can't have that. Got to have man in control. Got to have man in control. So what you do is you say, well, uh, God doesn't actually own everyone. God does not have the right to give anyone to the Son. The only ones that can be given by the Father and the Son are those that have freely already believed in the Father. They have enabled the Father. They've, they've, it, it's the sheep that chose the Father as shepherd then can be given by the Father to the Son to, for him to be their shepherd. But the choice has to be the sheep and never the shepherd. Never the shepherd. Can't have the shepherd. No, 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 no. Can't do that. Can't do that. So, there you go. There you go. And that's... How does that, how does that answer to John chapter 6? Well, I, I, don't, I don't believe that it does. Um, beginning at verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. So what's his focus upon? His focus is upon himself as the central mechanism of providing spiritual sustenance. And that these men were looking for the wrong sustenance. They weren't looking for a savior. They were looking for a miracle worker. For I, all the father, you, you, you do not believe, all that the father gives me will come to me. These folks are saying, oh, naturally. Naturally, because they've already come to the Father. There's nothing about coming to the Father in John chapter 6. There's nothing about that being the pretext. There's nothing about that being the prerequisite. That which allows, that which gives God the right to do something, it's not there. All that the Father gives me will come to me. That's what, there, there's where the faith is. There's no, there's no faith before that. There's no concept of having 
faith in the Father separately from the Son, and that that's what then enables the Father to give you to the Son. That's complete eisegetical insertion, but it's absolutely necessary. I understand why it's necessary. If that's your tradition, if you think that that's just the big thing, you've got to you've got to defend it. I have. I, there's lots of reasons why people do what they do with the text of Scripture. All that the Father gives me will come to me. It's the giving of the Father that the results in the coming to the Son. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. Well, talk about speaking the obvious. I mean, I mean, if we take this interpretation that is being offered to us here, if we take the interpretation that it is man's faith that allows him to uh, that allows God to give him to someone, then how could Jesus ever cast out such a person in the first place? I mean, think of it. Read, read, read John 6.37 again in that way. All that the Father gives me, who have given themselves to the Father already, will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. Well, how could he ever cast out one? That would result in a disunity in the Godhead itself. Wouldn't it? He's not really saying anything here. I'm just going to follow the status quo, is what Jesus is saying here. Because they've already come to the Father, and now they're getting a special revelation of who I am, and I won't cast them out either. Oh, that's nice. All of this really detracts from both the sovereign power of the Father and the Son. Because the emphasis here is, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. The focus is on the power of Jesus to save a specific people. And that's going to lead to why the end of John chapter 6 is not depressing. Because what's at the end of John chapter 6? Beginning 5,000 excited men. The end, 11 confused Three disciples and one devil. Why isn't that depressing? Because God doesn't want his church filled with driftwood in the first place. And God knows those who are his, and he's going to accomplish his purposes. That's why it's not depressing. So anyway, just a focus there uh, upon what's going on uh, in the establishment uh, of a synergistic reading. Uh, all right, well, I just now saw this. And uh, that's an awful long section uh, that I'm supposed to be reading here. And I don't see anything whatsoever to do with the topic at all. Completely 1,000% irrelevant. If you've given me the right reference. That's the right reference. Okay, well, we were we were told that um, we had a caller that said that uh, when you say disagree with both of you, it means me or a synergist? Uh, Don Johnson or Cheryl Schatz? Yeah, well, okay. You sure it was Acts 27, 23 through 31? I'm pretty sure that's what he said. Okay. So he he, he didn't want to go on the air because he, he, was, he was waiting for you to get back with him and uh, yeah, and uh -huh. uh, so that uh, y'all can get together and have a nice uh, uh -huh. chat. And uh, so he wants to wait for that. Okay. Okay. Well, I can't respond to it because I don't see it has absolutely anything whatsoever to do with the topic at hand. Yeah, uh, my phone will ring soon. Yes, I'm sure it will. 877-753-3341, um, I finally got the briefing uh, downloaded today. It was totally messed up in iTunes and, and on the web and everything. I finally got hold of it. And uh, Brother Moeller did mention this story that came out on the 2nd uh, from England. NHS to fund sperm bank for lesbians. 
Yep, NHS to fund sperm bank for lesbians. New generation of fatherless families paid for by you. Well, not by us, but we won't be very far behind them. Britain is to get its first NHS funded, and see that's what happens folks when you have national healthcare, uh, is those politicians get to determine what healthcare is. Um, Britain is to get its first NHS funded national sperm bank to make it easier for lesbian couples and single women to have children. <sighs> Remember not very long ago when there were lots of really smart people who were trying to tell us that what we see in our society is an all-out fundamental attack upon the family. And, our, and oh, everybody mocked them and, oh, come on, doesn't have anything to do with that. If you want to get married and have kids, no one's saying you can't do it. Blah, 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 blah. I can't think of anything that is any longer less disputable than that the forces of godlessness in our society loathe the family loathe the family they recognize that a father and a mother functioning in a biblical paradigm that is where you're not just looking to yourself you are looking to the future you are looking to the betterment of your children. You want your children to grow up to be responsible, God-honoring adults who will follow in your footsteps and will likewise marry and have children and serve in that fashion the church, the name of Christ, and because of that, the world around them, because that kind of person makes for a really good neighbor. The forces that hate Christianity hate the family. They hate when people give in to the stereotypes. They hate leave it to beaver. Because you got a daddy and a mommy and you've got a family and you've got people sitting around a table having Dinner together, shocking, right? Just shocking. But now we're really seeing. Here you have people who have become so self-obsessed. I, I mean, the culture of death is a culture of narcissism because life is found in serving others, not in just serving yourself. And so here you have the culture of narcissism. Oh, I want to get together with my girlfriend and we'll have babies. Disgusting. Loathsome in God's sight. They'll never be blessed by God. Those poor children. Child abuse. Absolutely child abuse. There was a day when we had enough common sense in Western culture to recognize that a child deprived its father. The community needed to come together and to try to Try to help that young man because that young man needs guidance. A, a, a child deprived of a mother, same thing. But to purposefully, out of your own perverse self-obsession, to bring children into the world in that context, whether you're a lesbian or even as a quote-unquote single mom, well, you know, I don't really have time for that man thing, but I, I would sort of like to have a child. Sort of, you know, play around with and dress up and don't really, doesn't really matter if it, if I'm purposefully putting it in the position of never having a father around. That's okay. I don't mind. It's all about me anyway. Just this. Absolute common sense has been washed away. Washed away. And it took a lot to get there. It took a lot of time and effort and a whole lot of the public um, 
the, the public school system. <laughs> uh, just just washing away the conscience of humanity itself. It, it's just absolutely amazing. But uh, Dr. Moeller commented on this, and uh, I, I won't even. I don't even know if I want to read through through all of this. Um, one person said, this is social experimentation. It's one thing for a child not to have a mother or father through tragedy, but it's another to plan children to come into the world without a father. Exactly. Exactly. Oh. Amazing. Amazing. Words absolutely fail me uh, to descri describe the amazing, amazing thing that's going on in our society. 877-753-3341. I just, as we were going on the air, saw that Simon Gathercole from the University of Cambridge has a new book out, unfortunately, <laughs> published by Brill. <clears throat> the Gospel of Thomas, Introduction and Commentary. Um, maybe one of the first full scholarly uh, analyses of the Gospel of Thomas in a commentary form. Now that's exciting. Uh, Gather Cole's good, and I would love to read it myself. One little problem. <laughs> it's from Brill. Uh, average Brill book in my library. At Average? I think I've gotten a couple of Brill books that were only $129. I think there's a couple. I would say the average price is $169. This one's $250. $250. And I, I think I... I, I <coughs> excuse me. I think I saw this. Uh, I lost it here. Um, I think I saw this from Hurtado's blog and he made some somewhat humorous comment about hoping that the paperback uh, would require something less than a gold reserve. I, I forget what the joke was. He, he was acknowledging that it is outlandishly and absurdly expensive. But um, eventually, and, and the paperback... If if it's a hundred if it's two hundred and fifty dollars hardback, the cheap paperback will probably be at least eighty nine, and that'd be a steal. That'd be a steal. So we'll see, we'll see. That is one book though that if it landed on my desk, uh, even in paper format, I would uh, I'd crush all the way through it. I really would, because uh, it's. Uh, I wonder how uh, does it. Uh, does it say? Uh, nee, 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 nee. Oh, wait, here it is. Ah! Well, <laughs> with the pages, it's still in the approximate, so this may not even be. Uh, publication date was May of 2014, so I'm not sure why they'd have an approximate number on it, but 700 pages. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a substantial tome. It's a, it's a substantial tome, so that's good. Oh, we have some, uh, we have some calls. All right. Um, Max, I was gonna get back to some of your book today. Sorry, uh, I, it's it's on my screen. I that little thing in this that's that's Kindle. <laughs> and see here, I'll, the task of a Molinus perspective of middle knowledge is to remove the perceived dilemma between human freedom and divine foreknowledge. See, I prove it. You you know you wrote that, and that's where I want to start with because that says a lot to me right there. Anyway, we'll get to it. I haven't forgotten about you, Max. I know you're still out there somewhere. Um, We'll see. Uh, by the way, we're trying to work on something in uh, Glasgow. So, trying to work on a uh, uh, debate in Glasgow. So, oh, that reminds me, I haven't heard back from him, but either on the Thursday show or next week, I want to have uh, my my good friend from South Africa, Rudolf Bushoff, on the program. We're going to have to try to do it via Skype. And I want to talk about the state of the church in South Africa. Uh, it's coming up. Um, haven't talked about it in a while, but we still need your help. 
uh, to get to South Africa and to get to Ukraine. And uh, as long as it still is Ukraine, um, and that, uh, you know, we don't have Ebola breakouts in South Africa and uh, that kind of fun stuff, unfortunately. Um, but uh, we still need your assistance with that. Uh, Rudolph has been working on lining up debates. He's got some great topics lined out. Uh, it's nice to have somebody down there that knows what they're doing and knows what kind of subjects would be really best to fill out the dialogue between Christians and Muslims. And uh, we're trying to get a Muslim down there to really deal with Isaiah 53 and and uh, exciting stuff. So I'm going to try to have him on, and uh, and we'll we'll go from there. All right, let's get to some of these calls because we only have a short amount of time on the program today. Uh, let's talk to uh, Chris. Hi, Chris. Hey, how's it going? Going good. As um, as I just got a s- couple quick questions. Uh, first of all, um, I just want to thank you for your ministry. Mm-hmm. Um, the Lord has really used you greatly in my life. And uh, so, really quick, um, first question is more of like a general ministry question. Um, I know personally, I tend to, uh, when I get into theological uh, discussions with people, it's more of a head thing and not necessarily me. You know, you know what I'm trying to say. Um, I, I know I've heard you say it before, where we we uh, draw theological blood with our sword. Um, for you personally. What have you done in your life to make it less of a head thing and more of a head going down to the feelings and and doing theological truths, displaying them so that others might glorify God? Like, is there any practical thing you've you've been able to do in this matter? Well, <clears throat> normally when I'm talking about someone just drawing their theological sword and and running somebody through, I'm I'm talking about people who just want to win that particular argument and uh, exalt themselves if you're mm-hmm. if you're doing what you're doing for first and foremost for the glory of God and for the desire to see him using that truth that you're proclaiming um, to bring a person to a saving knowledge of himself um, or even as is so often the case, a situation where you're on the street or you're in a debate or something like that, even if God does not use your particular words for in life the person you're talking to, if there are mm-hmm. other people who are listening, knowing that he can utilize it in that way. So I remember very clearly a, a response I gave to one of the uh, the guys, and this, this has now been posted online fi- finally. I don't think we've ever gotten a copy, but... Um, in the debate in Lanasia, uh, there was a in South Africa there was a a Muslim that asked a question from the audience, and I think some people would be a little surprised at how aggressive I was in responding to him because he was being aggressive with me. But I was really thinking about other people at that particular point in time who needed to hear a strong response. This fellow. Now it just happened to turn out that a couple nights later he attended another debate and was like my best friend all of a sudden. So. He had actually respected the fact that I had not just, you know, laid over and and uh, given given him the floor. So the the, the point is, it's it's a matter of your your ultimate priority and why you're doing what you're doing. And the yeah. people the people who want you know, the people who've gone out uh, witnessing with us and and who wanted to do the the theolo- theological swordplay, they generally don't last long in it. Uh, they I they see. generally are not. They're they're a flash in the pan, and then it gets old after a while, and they move well, on to other things. So if you have perseverance, um, mm-hmm. that in and of itself is is uh, a really good thing. Well, I, I tend to notice myself. I mean, even though I go into a a conversation with good feelings, you, you know, just like in Paul said to the, to the Corinthians that this knowledge has a te- tendency to puff up our our head. You know, and I, I have that tendency sometimes i don't know if you've had that too where sometimes it it doesn't become about god but more about me and i don't know if there's any way you've had where if if you've ever experienced that and and how you'd had to deal with that maybe set yourself aside or how do you even notice that when it's gone awry you know well i think that's one of the reasons that uh we have we have a rule that only people who are uh involved with local churches uh that are members of local churches in good standing 
uh, should be involved in such activities because um, it doesn't you, you can't just do that kind of work you have to be balanced mm -hmm. in what you're doing and and the people who just do that kind of thing eventually do either burn out or end up joining the groups that they're trying to deal with or uh, right. spiraling off into heresy or whatever else it, it might be but having a, a, a proper balance and recognizing that you know the kingdom of God's going to go on whether you're around or not uh, really comes from just having maturity in Christ and if you're in a good church you're going to be having that preached to you every Sunday pretty much right. so um, it really really comes from from having that kind of a balance and and doing apologetics within the context of the church is the way that it that really must be done, or it, it does become a sort of caricature. Okay, I've got one more really quick question. Um, I feel myself called to the ministry, and um, I, I do love the Southern Baptist Convention, but I, I know, I, I'm not, I'm kind of new to it. I know that there's some uh, seminaries that are kind of very liberal, and some that are more like Southern Theological Baptist Seminary, which is a lot more centered. And I was just wondering if you could just give me a couple of recommendations as to the more um, solid, you're seminary. talking about Southern Baptist seminaries. Yes, there are only there are only a certain number of them, and it's um, I don't care what seminary you go to, um, you are going to have to be very very discerning. Okay. Um, and while it's easier and more enjoyable uh, to go to a seminary mm -hmm. where. Uh, Pretty much everybody's on the same page. Uh, to be mm -hmm. honest with you, I didn't know why at the time, but I had to go to a seminary where almost nobody was on the same page, and that ended up <laughs> being my greatest uh, benefit, was that okay. I had professors who taught the perspectives that I would then have to be responding to uh, in my ministry later on, and that, that was extremely helpful. So... Uh, obviously, uh, Southern uh, is best known as as having the widest range of of solid uh, teaching and consistency of teaching along those lines. But you're going to find solid people uh, at all the seminaries. Even you'll find solid professors um, at the seminaries that are best known for being anti-reformed. Mm. But I couldn't ever recommend that someone go to a seminary where you're going to have to go on a a, a quest. Uh, you're going to have to uh, get Indiana Jones to help you find uh, that one gem amongst the the hailstorm of uh, of uh, wheat and chaff uh, that is all the other stuff that's going on at that seminary. So I, I can tell you that. Southwestern and New Orleans both are well known for promoting an anti-reformed perspective. Um, yeah. You know, uh, so all of them are going to have a, a differing mixture of reformed, non-reformed, and then conservative, non-conservative when it comes to professors as well. So they're all a mixture there. They're all a mixture there. And uh, so you, you really... What you have to do is determine what you want to be your major focus and then look at who's teaching at the campus that you'd be attending. So, for example, a, a number of the seminaries are recognizing, they're seeing the handwriting on the wall. The big centralized, um, we may have to go a little longer. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll catch everybody else on the phone. So, Jeff and Andrew, don't, don't hang up. We'll, we'll get to you, even if we have to go a little long. Um, the feed's working. We better use it while it's, while, while, it's, while, it's, while it's functioning. It's not cutting out right now. Let's use it. Um, <clears throat> but what you want to, might want to do is, uh, at least if you can, get an idea of what you want to focus upon. And mm -hmm. then look at the staff at each of the seminaries uh, in that area. So, for example, you might have a seminary that has a lot of good systematic theologians, but... You specifically want to do text criticism, and that may not be the best place for you to go to be able to do that. And another place might have a lot better uh, teachers in that particular area, maybe some published authors in that particular area. And you might have to hold your nose in a few classes there or something like that. But it, <clears throat> it's always going to be a, um, uh, a mixture, a balance like that. 
And I'm not convinced that it's not appropriate for you to have to go through some classes where you really are uncomfortable because it may very well help to ground you in those those issues even better than if you're just going with the flow along with everybody else. And then you get mm-hmm. out of there and all of a sudden, boom, you discover this whole other world of, of um, opposition and, and other perspectives and things like that. So, you know, there are some people who say that, that, that seminary should just be a just a learning experience as far as positive, everyone's on the same page. But I don't know, in the, in the society we live in today, might be, might be best to get your, sto- your, your toes stomped on a number of times in seminary before you actually get out and into the, into the real world, and uh, you might be in a little better stead at that point. Uh, well, if I did end up getting a hardcore Arminian um, um, professor, um, w- would he dock me for any kind of points if I, uh, depends you on know... The, uh, depends on the professor. Depends on the school. Okay. Can't, All right, well, thank say. you very much. All righty, Chris, thank you. Appreciate it. All, All right. right, God bless. Bye-bye. God bless. All right, let's uh, go to uh, Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Hello, is this James White? Uh, that's generally the person who answers the phone here. <laughs> Sorry about that. Hey, um, just um, a couple really um, quick questions, and um, the first one I hope I don't get hung up on. <laughs> um, not that thing you would, but it's just I'm, this is one that most people don't okay. like answering. Okay, I'm moving my cursor over to the drop button just in case here. So, uh, <laughs> And I can hit it fast, man, so, so behave. No, don't worry, no profanity. Um, all right. Here's the thing: is that you, I'm a I'm a Reformed Baptist like you, proud to be. But I also love my um, my Presbyterian brothers because oftentimes, you know, we I agree with the Presbyterians more things than often I do the um, most Baptist. I think you would yeah. experience that to some level as well. Yeah. But I can I can call them brothers because sure. even though they're because they even though they baptize their children, they do not believe in baptismal regeneration. Most of them. The level. <laughs> Most well, of yes. them. I'm, I'm yes, a little concerned yes. about some of the uh, some of the federal visionists, but that's another issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doug, Doug Wilson. Yeah, that whole deal. Well, and Doug's Doug's the Doug's the least radical of that group. So that's yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not even thinking about Wilson at that point. I, I think yeah, Wilson's yeah, yeah, yeah. my brother. Uh, I, was, I was just naming the right. biggest known one of them. Um, but the people who really, really believe in baptismal regeneration, according to what I've been reading, um, is Lutherans, and Martin Luther especially. Uh, um, depends on which Martin it, Luther and which Lutheran. Right, yeah, and, and so like, and having speaking to somebody who has not only learned an immense amount of church history, but taught church history— in Martin Luther's refined, like I guess you could say, in his last days, because I mean, like that's what I mean. You would want you want to want to look at the first um, copy of the Institutes of the Christian Religion for Calvin. You'd want to look at the last institute to get to know what his refined theology was. So, towards the end of his days, what would would you say that he believes in baptismal regeneration, of Luther, and a more and a more important question? Does should baptismal regeneration should we use that as a means to put people outside the pale of orthodoxy? Hmm. Um, I I do not claim to be a Luther scholar because uh, there is so much uh, to be read in Luther, and there's so much both development and contradiction in Luther uh, that I. I Anyone who does apologetics and then also claims to be a Luther scholar, it's one or the other. I don't, I don't think I, how you could possibly do both. But um, I would I would struggle a little bit with the idea that what you want is Luther's final perspective because, to be honest with you, uh, the pre-1525 Luther, I think, right. resonates a whole lot more uh, biblically than than the post, and it's not ha- it doesn't have anything to do with uh, theological maturity. If anything, it has to do with such a pressure in regards to the relationship between church and state. Right. Um, that between him and what's his name, the Duke guy. Well, not just that, and not just not just later Melanchthon's influence. That's a, that's a whole another issue, but. 
uh, given what happened with the Peasants' Revolt and what Luther said about it and then southern Germany breaking away and there just seems to be a real change uh, in Luther's perspective on certain things because of what took place politically uh, in his context. And so when you say, well, we want to go with the mature Luther, um, I'd rather go with the most biblical Luther who is not as influenced by the political uh, situation around him as any other Luther. So that that's where I, I struggle a little bit with the idea of saying, well, you know, at the end of his life, he wrote all those anti-Semitic things, which were just reflective of the general culture of his day, unfortunately. Um, Very true. But still, um, is is that what you really want to look at? And as far as I can tell, you can prove when you when you talk about baptismal regeneration for Luther, now you're raising all the issues of infantile faith, the relationship between justification by faith and infantile faith and sacramentalism and I don't I've listened to a lot of folks you know Chris Rosebaugh is a Lutheran and so he he does his thing I don't believe that it's possible to put forward a consistent Martin Luther doctrine on that because Luther was a theologian of the heart not a theologian of the head and the very thing that um, Calvin, Calvin I'm sorry unlike Calvin I was going to say, the very thing that Calvin is is uh, attacked for is the fact that, and I'm, I'm in the same boat here, and so if we're wrong, then, but I don't think God is glorified by inconsistency. I don't think God is glorified by my affirming contradictory statements about, about God. And so, uh, clearly, uh, Calvin had the emphasis in his thinking that, I need to listen to all of what God has to say, and if there are things he says that my heart doesn't like, um, then my heart needs to change. I don't need to change what God has said. So uh, Luther Luther was a great theologian, but he was not nearly as consistent uh, as, um, as Calvin was. And so I don't think you can put together a, a you know, uh, there, I've, I've talked to Lutherans who greatly de-emphasize the concept of uh, baptismal regeneration in that sense. They have a high view of baptism, but they have a higher view of justification by faith. And then I've met Lutherans who are just straight down the road. I was baptized when I was an infant. That's all I need. Voila. Um, uh, and which, which seems to me a lot like um, those... Um easy believism when you're five years old, you say a prayer, and you're sealed forever. I mean, it seems very similar to that to me. Again, it depends on the, on the Lutheran you're talking to. Um, and um, you know, there's, just, there's, just, there's just a lot of wiggle room there. I mean, one of the, one of the, one of the first people that um, assisted us back in the early days of the, uh, of the Internet, uh, and I had a lot of discussions about this very kind of thing, and... Um, uh, I've talked to many a Lutheran that was so... It's interesting. The Lutherans that I've talked to that have had the most interaction with Rome and hence have the most reaction against Rome are the ones that emphasize the earlier Luther and his justification statements and de-emphasize the uh, idea of infant baptism actually resulting in um, uh, regeneration. And then the Lutherans who are much more ecumenical in spirit in the sense of Roman Catholicism, just the opposite. So probably not a, a, a satisfactory answer for you, but I don't claim and and see a bunch of people. Who was that guy? There was some, remember the guy in Limited Atonement um, last year sometime, early, about a year ago, more than a year ago. There was a Lutheran guy that that wanted to debate on Limited Atonement. So I'm sorry, I don't even remember the guy. I, I responded to something. He, he called in, remember? And we, we had that, we had that, you know, people say, well, why you debate all these other people in this? Why won't you debate? Because to debate a Lutheran is to fall into an abyss of, of uh, a massive amount of material. And uh, it's, oh, just like, it's just like Eastern Orthodoxy. I'm sorry, there's only so much I can do. 
and there's only so much time in the day and uh, I want to do what I do well and it, I have no feeling whatsoever that the Lord is asking me uh, to start spending uh, those hours that I spend uh, studying as it is, expanding that out to reading Luther and trying to figure out uh, where each of these Lutheran groups are coming from and what their influences are and how much they read of Melanchthon and, and where they are in the development. I just, I just know how complex the issues are. And um, a lot of the people that were clamoring, ah, you're hiding from this guy, just don't know what the issues are. The same thing with, so, Eastern, with Eastern Orthodoxy, same thing. So, so but, but, but just, to, just to be clear, but anybody who says just a, a regeneration and therefore justification occurs at the moment of baptism, whether that's at um, infant stage or, I guess you could say, in the way the Church of Christ does it, you have to prove your worthiness of baptism and then do it. Any sort of baptismal regeneration is outside the pale of orthodoxy. Outside the pale of biblical orthodoxy, I would say yes. If they are simply stay, an ex opera operato sacramentalism, um, that fundamentally denies the freedom of God in uh, election and uh, the nature of saving faith, yes. Um, does that mean that a person who believes that a child could be regenerated, but they have to be of the uh, elect and so on and so forth, it can get pretty pretty sticky there. And obviously, as a Baptist, I just go, you know, it'd be a whole lot easier just to allow the New Testament to speak wait, here. Wait till they're older and uh, well, baptize, baptize, well, baptize. Just, just, follow the New Te- just follow the New <laughs> Testament paradigm. That might be good. <laughs> it would be, simplify things a whole lot. Just, just a little bit. Uh, just a little bit. Yeah. Hey, um, yeah, and one last thing. Real quick, I still, that... gotta, I still gotta get to Jeff. Oh yeah, sorry about that. Well then, have a great day. And, oh no, no, um, you, if you want Chris, to get the one, get the other one in real quick. Okay, um, do you think that um, when you're trying to explain um, the Trinity, and completely shifting gears, when you're trying to explain the Trinity to non-Trinitarians or people who simply don't understand it, explaining the fact that God is outside of the universe and therefore He created logic, logic and therefore not absolutely subject to it is a good way to go? I don't believe that the Trinity is illogical. Uh, it, oh. um, so I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go there because um, I think there is a, a meaningfully communicable distinction between being and person. And once you can communicate that to someone, um, the alleged contradictions um, disappear because we're talking about a, a unique being. Uh, we're not looking for analogies that are going to uh, uh, work in, in every way because if he's truly unique, then there is no analogy in the created order that would, that would actually fit. And right. once you recognize that being in person are not the same thing, no, I, 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 I wouldn't go there because I don't think that there is a, a contradiction to logic. It may be a, above our experience, but it's not illogical. Is, is that in your book, The Forgotten Trinity? Yes. All right. Good okay. thing that's on my reading list. All, All right. Thank you, Andrew. Light. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Last call. Let's get to Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Dr. White. How are you doing? Doing good. Okay. I, I'll try to make it quick. Um, so I was having a conversation with some Roman Catholics a little bit ago, and uh, one of uh, uh, justification was kind of what we were discussing. And uh, they couldn't quite understand, since uh, biblical justification, when kind of we were dealing with James and Romans, how uh, genuine faith will lead to genuine works. They, they couldn't quite get how that differed. Uh, or why that difference uh, between that and Rome mattered. And I pointed them to Galatians and trying to point out how uh, it mattered to Paul. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> uh, <laughs> which, you know, since we had the same authority, I, 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 but that really didn't really cut it with them. So I was wondering if that topic has ever come up with you. <laughs> and um, obviously it has. But if that specific points come up... Uh, uh, how old that with the Roman Catholic? Well, yeah, um, I wrote a book a number of uh, years ago called The Roman Catholic Controversy, 
and there are about uh, three or four chapters on, uh, uh, well, at least uh, chapters uh, nine and ten, actually, are on the subject of justification. And you'll find um, that that's sort of the heart of the book, because the thesis of the book is that the, um, the Roman gospel cannot give a person uh, peace, um, because they, they cannot look back upon that finished work. But not only that, but there are, are a number of rather interesting uh, citations. Uh, Ludwig Ott has a, a citation, and I'm uh, looking for, I would assume it would be in here someplace. Uh, da -da 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 -da. I wonder if Ludwig Ott is in the, well, look at that. I've got a scripture. Oh, there we go. Uh, Ludwig Ott. Could we have some, uh, oh, there's John O'Brien. Oh, there's Ludwig Ott. Oh, great. Uh, way too many citations of Ludwig Ott, but 132 and 134 could put me in the right place here. It would help if I was wearing my glasses. Aha, I found it. It was at the top of the page. There's the problem. Uh, listen, listen to what Ludwig Ott had to say. I knew it was in here. This is in his book, uh, Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma. The reason for the uncertainty of the state of grace lies in this. That without a special revelation, nobody can with certainty of faith know whether or not he has fulfilled all the conditions which are necessary for achieving justification. So, think about what that, what that means. Um, the, the Roman Catholic considers it to be presumption for you to believe that you know that you have eternal life. Because you cannot know with certainty whether you have fulfilled all the conditions necessary for achieving justification. That's what happens when you redefine justification from its biblical parameters to the Roman Catholic concept. The other illustration that Martin Luther, to use a previous caller, actually may have touched on, this, is, this may be one of those illustrations that Luther did or did not use, but uh, it does tend to get some good airplay in, in discussions with Roman Catholics. And that is the issue of the dunghill. If you remember that it has been uh, attributed to Luther, and it certainly is a Lutherian, it's certainly not a Melanchthonian, so it, it certainly would fit with Luther. Um, if you've ever heard the story that Luther likened the difference between justification and sanctification to being a, a pile of dung, uh, when uh, the snow... The first snow of the season comes. It 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 covers over uh, those piles of dung that back in the olden days the Germans would keep out in the field because that's going to be their their uh, uh, fertilizer for the next spring to make their fields fertile. So uh, obviously, until that time, especially on a hot uh, fall day in Germany, uh, those are going to smell and they're going to have flies and it's going to be ugly. But that first Snowfall comes and it covers over everything, and he likened justification that snowfall. The dung is still dung, but its offensiveness has been taken away. And Roman Catholics love to go after that by saying that's just that's just horrible. That's just such a surface level understanding. And 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 if and if if all Luther was saying was that all God has done for us is to uh, cover us over with some snow and leaves us a dung pile, then yeah. But what he was saying was that justification is not about us, it's about our standing to God. It's about removing the impediments to our relationship with God. It is a forensic declaration. It's the removal of that guilt on the basis of what somebody else has done. He said a lot more than just that, but his point was to point out that it is not changing the pile into something else that makes it pleasing. It is the covering over of it by that which is pleasing in God's sight. And I like to turn that around and say to the Roman Catholic, okay, let's, let's, let's look at the, the, the hill of dung analogy from your perspective. What you're saying is you're a pile of dung until you're baptized. And when you're baptized, you're turned into a pile of gold. And that's why you go to heaven, is because gold is pleasing to God. And he wants it in heaven with him. And so you get to go to heaven. Problem is that in at least historic Roman Catholic theology, who knows what Roman Catholic theology is anymore, but 
at least in dogmatic historic Roman Catholic theology, if you commit a mortal sin, you lose the grace of justification, and boom, you become a pile of dung again. Um, so then you have to go through the process of the sacramental sacramental system uh, to be returned into a pile of gold. And then you also have temporal sins. And so as you experience temporal sins in your life, then you get flecks of dung and pieces of dung clinging to the surface of the gold. And so the gold is still good enough to get to go to heaven, but before it goes into heaven, it has to be purged, has to be cleaned. And so that's what purgatory is about. And so all the dung gets burned off by your suffering in purgatory. And the problem is you never know which one you are. You can't know in this life which one you are. You can have various levels of confidence, but you can't know whether you're a pile of dung or a pile of gold. Or the question I have is, though, besides ruining assurance, would, if I say Paul said the people who trust in more than Christ were condemned, right? right? Mm -hmm. So what is the reason for that condemnation? My kind of gut instinct is telling me that it's because you're trusting in more than Jesus. You're trusting in that dung, and you're basically saying that uh, Jesus can't pay for your sins. Is essentially what you're also saying. Well, you're, you, say, you're, you're saying that Jesus' payment is not enough without right. the addition of uh, either the merits of others, the merits of Mary, the merits of the saints, the merits of yourself. Um, certainly, it, it, it makes... Jesus' death earns a treasury of merit um, that then we, through the sacramental system, avail ourselves of that grace. Uh, it is a form of auto-soteriology. Uh, in its in it in it in its most bold form, uh, the problem is most of our evangelical friends also engage in forms of auto soteriology. Right. They just don't do it as boldly as the Roman Catholics do. Uh, that's why. So would you say? So say if you trust in more than Jesus, you're not really trusting in Jesus. Well, that, that what, a... uh, you, you went to Galatians. If you went to Galatians five, you probably went to some of the strongest language in the New Testament, Galatians chapter five. Um, and what did what did Paul say? He said, if, if you're circumcised, then you've got to go the whole way. Uh, Christ will be of no benefit to you. Uh, you have fallen from grace. Uh, the, the, the road of grace and the road of, of, of righteousness, of uh, self-righteousness, go 180 degrees opposite. You can't get very far down both roads. And uh, anyone who wants to try to make Jesus a, uh, a partial Savior or a co-Savior with themselves will find out he will not be a Savior at all. That's why Paul is so strong about this. He says, do not right. be subject again to a yoke of slavery. That's why we have to evangelize Roman Catholics, because they really have been given a gospel that does not save. Uh, one quick thing uh, before you have to close the show. Um, the Pope is coming to Philadelphia next September, and they're, really? expecting one to, and they're expecting one to two million people to show up. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. When, uh, when, he um, came here to, when the other Pope came here to Phoenix a long time ago, yeah. we had a lot of folks. Yeah, we're we're trying. Uh, there's a few of us in our uh, local church who are, you know, like thinking that you know something should be. We we would like to do something soon. Yep. But the uh, the the uh, the difference is is like we don't really know if there's anybody to uh, contact. And I was wondering if you know of a plane flying over. Anyone? Uh, anyone to contact about what? Uh, well, uh, basically doing some evangelism. Like, is there are there any good ministries uh, or other organizations to contact who might be beneficial to to be put in contact with? I know you're just kind of like a two to three man operation there, and street evangelism isn't quite your uh, your forte. Well, actually, we uh, we still have some good old tracks from the uh, from the olden days. Uh, don't have any of them, but we certainly could send somebody uh, a PDF file or something like that. But um, well, there's a lot of good uh, material on the subject of Roman Catholicism, but this is this is if you're talking about having are you have, talking about having somebody come in and do training for you, or are you talking about looking for materials, or uh, or what? Probably a little of both. Yeah, and also seeing uh, who would be interested. Uh, 
we're also looking for people in the area who would be uh, interested in doing it. Um, like we're, well, we're just looking for people who have contacts uh, for that type of uh, ministry. Uh, best thing I su- would suggest to you is someone uh, you'll you run to some interesting views among some of my Presbyterian brothers, but I bet you you'll find all sorts of folks at Westminster that are already thinking about it. Um, okay. That would be the first place I'd go and uh, say, okay, uh, what's what's already being planned? Because I didn't even know about it. So, But I'm sure somebody there knows about it. And um, uh, you're talking about September of 2015 or 2014? Uh, 2015. Yeah. 2015, Okay. Well, that's certainly something I would be interested. Uh, I would love to see if someone in that area, for example, would set up, a, you know, would challenge some of the uh, the Tim Staples and Patrick Madrids of the world to uh, engage in debate on the papacy before the Pope comes. Uh, well, you also wanted to do a debate with that Muslim guy in New Jersey, so you could kill two birds with one stone. If, well, we uh, are we are doing that. Uh, that that's going to happen. I think we already set the date for that in October, but. Um, this is this is so this, just a month. That's fine. That's just this year. <laughs> We're talking next year. So oh, next year. Uh, if if I, I think in the in the time now, that's not World Youth Day, is it? Uh, it's like a family conference thing. Oh, okay. I think. Uh, I'm so not sure. It's, it's like a two or three day thing. Okay. Uh, well, there'll still be a lot of interest in it, and so um, uh, you're now officially charged with funding out if uh, anybody there wants to. Uh, Host a debate and uh, see if we can uh, get uh, uh, you know someone like a, a Tim Staples or somebody to come out and debate the issue of the papacy itself. We would love to uh, love to do that. So, uh, but yeah, I'd, well, I'd give somebody through, at Westminster uh, a call. Maybe through Twitter or other channels, I'll try to ping you occasionally and try to uh, keep you abreast of uh, progress. Or yeah, that'd be good. Try- or uh, try to see what's going on because obviously I have no idea what I am doing. So <laughs> I, <laughs> I might be the perfect vessel. <laughs> well, actually, actually, Chris uh, Chris Arnzen's up in uh, in Pennsylvania, so uh, he he's he's not all that far from there. So uh, might just need to get him involved because he's helping set stuff up for this uh, trip back in in October. So. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm involved pretty well with the Jewish ministry, and and we have interest in helping out, but at the same time, it's like, well, we're a Jewish ministry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you could have some interesting uh, so jokes, uh, you know. So, so we're used to getting yelled at on the street. Right, right. We can, ha- we can handle ourselves on the street. It's just, uh, gotcha. you know, we would like... Uh, and also, we, you know, if, if there's going to be a million people, you know, all hands on deck. Yeah, sort of I hear you. I hear you. All right, Jeff, we'll be looking forward to hearing from you. All right. Well, uh, we'll be in touch then. Okay. God bless you. Thank you for Thank, your ministry. Thanks. Thanks for calling. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right, folks. Thanks for listening to the Dividing Line today. We went. Uh, I was almost jumbo. I mean, eight more minutes. We would have got would have been a, been a jumbo edition. But uh, most important thing is you actually heard all of it. That was the good part. So now we got to put stuff back together and and just very slowly do the other stuff. Don't touch it. You'll break it. That's exactly right. <laughs> We'll see you next time. God bless.